Obviously, this is a, a, a frightening incident and not the type of service that we want to provide to our customers. I want to offer my apology to the folks who were on that train uh, who had to experience that. I also want to offer my apology to the folks who were inconvenienced by the diversion of service that we had to put in place following that incident. Um, as the incident was occurring, the train was halted. The call went in to, uh, to cut power to the train. Uh, train the, that power was, was cut in under two minutes. There were approximately 200 individuals on the train. Uh, there was an evacuation uh, initially led by the motor person on the train, but then by um, other T personnel who came to assist. Uh, there were a number of people who self-evacuated through uh, several windows on the train. We believe there were four windows that were removed uh, and folks evacuated th uh, through, through, through that space. The, uh, the scene was then stabilized um, and investigated. The train was brought into the Wellington car house at approximately 8, 10 a.m. And by 11 a.m., uh, all the necessary inspections had been, had been made to the right of way and service uh, was restored. Uh, I do want to provide a little bit of background on the incident train, which again is an Orange Line train, train 1251. It was part of a train set uh, that started the day in Forest Hills, made one northbound trip and had turned around and was in the process of making its first southbound trip when the incident occurred. Um, I'd, also, um, I'd also note that uh, this train had last been inspected on June 23rd, so under a month ago, and the sill in question uh, that, had, that came loose um, had been inspected as part of that inspection and all of this series of train are inspected every 12,000 miles, which means, uh, which means roughly, uh, in kind of average level of service, would be roughly every two to three months. Um, I want to emphasize that this, these are our initial findings. I thought it was important to come out and talk publicly about our initial findings, given the gravity of the incident. We will continue to investigate. We are also working uh, in, in cooperation with a variety of parties. We had fire personnel from both Medford and Somerville assist this morning. We also had state police uh, engagement at the scene as well as our own transit police. Uh, we are working with DPU on this and we have briefed uh, the FTA as well on the particulars of this incident. We also immediately dispatched teams into the field to inspect every other Orange Line vehicle uh, to check this sill. Every vehicle in, in service currently um, was inspected earlier today and we're also inspecting vehicles. Uh, and I've not received any word uh, that there was any other issue found. We're also inspecting the vehicles that are at the car house. Um, I don't, you know, I think obviously uh, many of you have seen the, uh, the visual images that have come from this. Um, obviously a very frightening event and, uh, you know, not the service that the MBTA wants to provide. And it is, it is these types of incidents uh, that we are working to prevent and avoid every day. This incident happened and I think it's important uh, that we step forward and acknowledge it. And again, you know, I want to express uh, my apology to our customers who experienced that today. So that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take questions now. You know, I think in each one of these cases, we, we work to understand what the, why the incident happened and how we can prevent it. Um, you know, I think each one of these incidents is, is somewhat different in each way. Um, we continue to work on our inspection processes. We have done a, gr a great deal of work, uh, particularly in light of the, the safety review panel in 2019, to actually have more inspections, to have third party inspections. So it's extraordinarily frustrating when these types of incidents happen, but I think we have to take, we have to take responsibility. Sorry. No, in the case of a in the case of a vehicle that's been been disabled like this, um, the safest course of action is to evacuate the train. Um, this you know this particular location is an is really an acute 
vulnerability. You're a significant distance from either one of the stations and you're up there on the bridge. Um, I think one of the one one fact that or one question that that was raised previously, uh, it is there is a commuter rail also runs on that bridge and it is divided. There is a chain link fence that physically separates the two reservations. So, you know, one of the things we worry about in self evacuation is the potential to have a live third rail or other other traffic. So in this case, we were able to cut power to the third rail in under two minutes. And there is, you know, you can't physically get to the commuter rail reservation. There's a chain link fence throughout. Yeah, and I think this, this one is, I think, sometimes uh, not necessarily well understood. We don't want people exiting onto the right of way particularly if there is a live third rail there. What the motor person did was pass through the car, open the doors so you could pass through and exit the train from the rear. That's the, um, and I, 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 don't, I don't have the specific timetable under which that happened. Some folks made the decision to self-evacuate, which I, I, I understand, but we also did have an evacuation through the rear of the train. It is, it is part of our training. We also do a number of drills at our emergency center uh, where we practice evacuating trains. Um, I think it is a struggle in a, fluid, in a fluid situation like that to have people on scene. We were able to get personnel from the Wellington car house, both supervisors and some, some, some motor persons who happened to be on break. We were able to get them on scene relatively quickly because this is one of the, this is sort of a, a, you know, a, a place where people get on and off the system who work for the T. So they were able to access the site relatively quickly. I think for someone on the train who's, you know, who's, who needs communication immediately, that's always a challenge in, in the moment like that. It's really, um, you know, the, I think the motor person in this case followed protocol and did, did what they should, but I think it was still a very unsettled situation. You know, I, I wouldn't want to, obviously the heat is having an, an impact on our operations. And I think if, you know, if anyone was, was you know, saw yesterday, we, we struggled with some, for instance, drawbridges sticking in the upright position. Um, the sill itself is riveted to the vehicle. Um, and I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to engage in guesswork uh, around if the heat had any impact, but it will be something that we look at. The sill is essentially like a, a, I guess if a train would come by, I could show you. It's essentially like a, almost like a metal piece of siding that is, uh, it doesn't have any, it, it doesn't have any structural role, but it covers up a portion of the vehicle, almost, you know, almost akin to like aluminum siding at your house, or if you've got a sill, uh, it's somewhat like that. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's in, sorry, that's a, that's a helpful question. It's a, it's on a lower part of the train, so it, it detached. And then it, it, it detached enough so that it came in contact with the third rail, which the third rail is quite low. And that's, once you had that contact with the third rail, you had a number of arcing spark incidents and that, that led to what you saw. Can you back up like 10 seconds? Sorry. I remain confident in the safety of the MBTA. I took the orange line here. I'll take it back. Uh, I, I regularly take public transportation. I think we have had a series of incidents. I think we are working hard. You know, the, the FTA oversight I think adds to our ability to make the system safer. Transit as a transit as a whole in the MBTA in in itself is uh, significantly safer than uh, most other forms of transportation. So I remain confident in the MB, in the MBTA safety. Um, I think there's a lot we can do to make it safer, and obviously the situation, the situation that happened this morning wasn't safe, and I think we're going to do everything we can to prevent it from happening again. Oh, sorry, I did not get to that in my notes. This train was put in service in January 1980. With incidents like today's and commuters having to wait longer for train 
rates as you hire dispatchers. Has the MBTA given any thought to reducing fares, giving free rides for a certain amount of time, just anything from a customer service perspective? Uh, sorry, just to answer this question quickly, it was January 1980. Uh, to answer your question, uh, right now, no, we have not given any consideration to any kind of fare reduction. Um, you know, I think we're we're in a situation where we're trying to, uh, you know, right now we're talking about additional resources uh, to invest in things like safety and service. So I don't think we'd be in a position uh, in a position to do that. Was anybody evacuated from the train, or did they self evacuate before the third rail was turned off? I don't. I, I don't know. I don't have the timing. Uh, I don't. I we, we don't have the precise timing on that. I you mentioned that this is a concern. Are you? I mean, when you look at what happened, is it a huge relief that nobody who's jumping onto these tracks came into contact? With you know, I think anytime anytime you have customers on the right of way, um, it, it, it you you worry about their safety. Uh, and I you know I should I should note that there were no injuries. Uh, no injury, no injuries uh, reported from any of the approximately 200 folks who were evacuated. But anytime you have folks on the right of way, yes, you worry about their safety. Can we, Just, uh, can we let someone else ask? I don't know the answer to either one of those questions, and I think that will be part of our investigation. Um, that has not been brought to my attention previously, but it is. It will be part of our investigation. You know, I, I think I will let the executive branch and the legislative branch uh, sort that one out about what the optimal structure for the T is. I think any, you know, anything, uh, anything that those parties can do and other parties can do to help us make the MBTA safer, I would be open-minded about. You're asking if it was an original piece of yeah. equipment. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And has the T ever experienced where that part of the train comes off and touches into the ground before? Not, uh, not in my limited experience. But I um, obviously I'm not a you know I, I'm not in vehicle maintenance, and you know my engagement with the T began in, in 2015. Uh, one more question. All of, the, all of the current vehicles on the Orange Line will be replaced by the new vehicles over time. We're in the process of uh, taking delivery and burning in those new vehicles. So as soon as we have a, an adequate supply of, of new vehicles ready to go, we'll be replacing all of the trains on both the Orange Line and the Red Line. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, th I think one of the things we'll take a look at is if we need to if we need to tighten up our training and tighten up our protocols around communication and specifically the training that we give officials. Um, I think that's something we'll certainly take a look at. Okay, thank so, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've been listening to T General Manager Steve Poftak giving a full apology to the people on the train this morning and those who were inconvenienced. As you see here, when this Orange Line train was halted, it had caught on fire. Uh, and a call went in to cut power to that train, he says, in under two minutes. But approximately 200 people were on board that train. In the frantic moments right after, of course, it's difficult to communicate exactly how to evacuate a train like this. You see video of people removing four windows in all to just jump out the windows of the train. One woman told WBZ she jumped down into the river to escape the train. She was so fearful for her life. A POFTAC says that the train was removed. It was brought to the car house by 10 a.m. By 11 a.m., inspections had been made. Service was restored to that part of the area. He says this train started in Forest Hills, was about to go southbound near Wellington when the incident occurred. Uh, this train had been inspected on June 23rd, just a few weeks ago. Every uh, 12,000 miles, trains uh, should be inspected 
every two to three months. And so invest officials will be investigating exactly why this incident occurred this morning. Uh, he also mentioned that perhaps training about communication needs to be improved because the plan on a train like this is to always evacuate out the back. But you can see from this video the fear in people's eyes as soon as they realized there was fire and they just took matters into their own hands, broke windows, and jumped out on their own. And so a lot of questions still to come, certainly from people who were on board this train. Uh, but again, the T general manager offering a full apology accountability and that they will follow up on training and making sure they have answers about the exact timeline of what happened here this morning.